We're going to talk about surfing medicine. I'll do my own introduction real quick. Uh, my affiliations, I've met most of you, um, but I'm Andrew Schmidt. I'm an emergency medicine physician with UF Health Jacksonville and also with Trauma One Flight Services. Uh, medical director for, for Jack's Beach Ocean Rescue. I was a lifeguard there for a long time. Volunteer Life Saving Corps, uh, co-founder of Lifeguards Without Borders, and also instructor with Surfing Medicine International. Uh, so today we're going to talk about surf medicine. So what the hell is surfing medicine? Uh, well, this is mainly going to cover very common injuries that you'll see in surfers, but also anyone who's coming to the beach. Um, so we're going to teach with an international group of surfing doctors who we, we uh, train people on just how to, how to treat common surf injuries. So the kind of stuff that you typically see um, on a day at the beach. So this link right here will tell you everything that you need to know about this talk. Um, so once you write it down, you can put your pencils down, sit back and relax. I'm also recording this and I'll have it up online later and I'll put a link to that video um, on this handout as well. So again, that link right there has a handout, everything you need to know. It'll have a link to the video. Um, it'll also have a link to contact me if you need to at a later date. And the very last slide will have that link as well. All right, so four main things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about marine envenomations. We're going to talk about lightning injuries. We're going to talk about hyperthermia. And we're talking about bleeding control. So kind of our four common things that our lifeguards can actually do some, something about. Anytime I teach, anytime I talk about preparing protocols or making medical kits, my whole thing is what can a first responder or ENT save a life doing in the first five to ten minutes? There's so many fancy toys and stuff out there, but what can we actually do to save a life in the first five minutes? I talked about drowning yesterday, and that's one thing we can save a life. But these things right here, our guards, it can be a 16-year-old first responder, and they can save a life better than any doctor or any paramedic um, if they know what they're doing with these four topics. So first off, talking about marine envenomations. Uh, this will be a very basic overview, mainly focused on the main classifications and species that we have in the U.S. This is a very controversial topic because no one really knows what the hell we're doing when it comes to it because there's no great science on it. But we're going to talk about the main species that we'll see and kind of the basic treatment of that. So this chart right here just shows you the jellyfish of the Great Barrier Reef. So that's just an example to show you how many different jellyfish are out there. So you can't really just say, here's how you treat a jellyfish sting, because there are thousands, if not millions, of species of different animals out there that can sting you. Um, so again, it's hard to really focus the talk, but I'm going to give you just what evidence we currently know, as well as the current international and national uh, guidelines and recommendations. Uh, so basically we're going to talk about the nadaria, and the way they sting you is they have a stinging apparatus on the tentacle, it has a nematocyst here, and it has a little thread that's coiled up and there's a trigger. And when something like your skin hits that trigger, it fires out and, and pinches into your skin and releases a toxin and causes a sting. So we'll talk about two general uh, groups within the nadarian. First is the uh, cyphozoa, and these are very common you'll see in Florida. So the moon jelly and the sea nettle. You walk down the beach any day, this is what you're seeing. Um, it, they, they're very mild sting, they're not very dangerous animals. In general, your common injuries are just going to be uh, some urtic carry some rash, some bumps on the skin. It's going to hurt, but you kind of go on your day. Ten minutes later, you're like, okay, that wasn't too bad, and you go on your day. It's, it's not really not too bad of a sting. Anyone here been stung by a common jellyfish? Most of you, okay. I think we've all spent enough time in the water. Uh, this one is a little more impressive. These are the hydrozoa. So this is the fire coral and the Portuguese man -o -war. Anyone been hit by a man -o -war? That sucks. I got hit by like that big. I thought I was, I, I was giving my last rights. I thought I was going to die. Um, so it, it actually does really, really hurt. Um, they're an impressive species. One of the most beautiful things you'll ever see in the water. And that's what kind of makes them dangerous as well. A lot of us have probably been on the tower and watched that 10 year old see that beautiful purple balloon in the water and start running toward it. And you're just like, oh, 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 no, oh, God. And then they get stung and then you're having to treat them. So they're very beautiful animals that, that kids like to go play with. Uh, but impressive species. They're actually a collection of species. It's not just one. One animal. The, the whole, it's a community of, of species along the tentacles. It has this air filled balloon and it actually acts as a sail and they just passively move through the water. And it has these tentacles that can be 20 to 30 meters long. So you can be like, oh man, that's a man of war. That's pretty cool. And bam, you get hit 20 meters away. So really nasty animals. The other thing, in contrast to most jellyfish, their tentacles tend to break off and wrap around you. And guys, you, I'm, I'm preaching the choir. You guys have seen this before, but that's, that's what makes them dangerous as well. You come back on shore and the tentacles are still there and the nematocysts are still firing. Kind of that common, that classic uh, man -o war sting you see is that whip-like sting. So someone comes up and an hour later they got these just nasty scars. and They can become permanent as well. But you see this and that's pretty classic for a man -o war sting. 
So treatment-wise, first off is treating the pain. All right, there's two things we need to worry about in jellyfish: the pain and the severe allergic reaction. Um, and in terms of the pain. The evidence is weak. The evidence sucks. We don't know really what we're supposed to do because it's a, again a very hard thing to study. First off, there's thousands, if not millions, of species out there they have to worry about, and everyone's kind of different from the other ones. Um, the other thing is it's just a hard thing to study. They do take people in labs and actually sting them with tentacles and, and try different potions, but it, it kind of comes down to there's not much you can do. And my argument for it is that's not the important thing. Um, you may just have to tell the person, look, this is going to suck for a few minutes to a few hours. I'm sorry. Um, but we really need to treat the life threats like anaphylaxis and, and severe allergic reaction. Uh, so the evidence is weak, but there are some things that we know do help. Uh, first off, getting the tentacles off. So we saw in that initial video, we saw those nematocysts firing when they're when they're uh, when they're stimulated. Especially in man of war, the tentacle wraps around. There are unfired nematocysts on there that are still waiting to sting, and it and it hits something, hits it, and they're going to fire. They'll also fire from other things. They'll fire from changes in temperature, ch changes in salinity. So that's when we start talking about fresh versus salt water. Uh, changes in the os osmotic gradient of, of the fluid that's put on it. So really, if we can get those off the skin, that's that's the best start. So obviously wearing a glove yourself, picking them off the skin so you don't sting yourself, using a credit card, using tweezers. If you guys have seen man wore tentacles, they're like fine hair. You really got to get in there. It's best even with a magnifying glass and just carefully peel them off because they almost stick to the skin. Next is rinsing with some sort of solution. And I say some sort of solution because we don't know. What we do know is salt water tends to be better than fresh. Warm water tends to be better than cold. That's what we know. In terms of when talking about salinity, the fresh water itself can actually cause firing of the nematocyst. And again, this is very dependent on species, but this is a generalization. Also, warm water to tolerance tends to be better than just cold water. So, ideally, warm salt water is going to be the best. I think most of us have seen someone comes up to your lifeguard station, you probably end up just putting them under a hose because instead of just walking them all the way back to the beach. But just the evidence we have, salt better than fresh, warm better than cold. Urination, that's been debunked. We know that that doesn't really help, can actually make things worse as well. So the big con uh, conversation is, what about vinegar? Any beaches using vinegar right now? Are you using vinegar across the board for like any sting that comes up? Yeah. yeah. I think that's actually fairly common. Um, I, our beach was until fairly recently, um, and for a long time, the first beach I was at was using meat, meat tenderizer. You guys probably use that, making into a paste and all this stuff. Um, so vinegar, the, the jury's kind of still out on it. There's been some big studies recently. The couple things we do know. We do know fairly well from evidence that it probably works well for the box jellyfish. This is the box jellyfish. I didn't focus on it in this top due to, talk, uh, due to time, but there have been stings of the box jellyfish off Florida. Uh, people who have attempted to swim to, to Cuba from uh, South Florida actually have encountered box jellyfish, so they are around here. Uh, but it's, very, it's pretty rare for us. But there is evidence that the uh, vinegar does actually neutralize the toxin from box jellyfish. Um, other than that, there's not great evidence that it really helps, especially with the man war. Then there's concern that it might actually worsen stings from the man war. Now, of course, right before my, on my talk, my very nice colleague from Bavard County over here had to come up to me and say, hey, there's this new article you don't know about that you should probably read before you go talk in five minutes. Um, so I read through it real fast, and it's a cool study that was done out of Hawaii. It's 2017. It was in Journal of Toxins. And it was an in-lab study. It's not perfect because we rather study stuff on humans. But they looked at essentially animal meat and, and firing of nematocysts and looked at different solutions um, to, see what, to see what helped. In general, what they found was with salt water and vinegar and this, this commercial uh, sting aid that they used were about equal. Uh, and they're equal in effectiveness. What they did know that is if you use fresh water or urine or alcohol or other stuff, that made things worse. So we knew that. Um, what they did show was that the vinegar and this commercial sting aid, what they helped was avoiding firing from pressure. So the pressure being you taking the tentacle off. The vinegar did help neutralize, but it still allowed the nematocyst to fire once you try to pick it off. So again, this is one study. It's fairly new, it was in lab study, so not perfect. I just want to get in your head and I appreciate him uh, bringing that up to me. Uh, but when you kind of put all of this together, it, 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 we just don't know. We really don't know. Um, 
and I'll kind of go over the current international recommendations in a second, uh, but there's not great evidence to go on. But really, I think in my mind, what I want to teach people is the pain, it, it stinks. The, 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 the pain sucks, but if you're removing the nematocysts, making sure those are off, the process is going to stop and going to go away eventually. We need to worry more about the anaphylaxis. So really, everything comes down to a risk-benefit. And what we found from laboratory studies, there seems to be almost a little more risk of adding things like meat tenderizer and vinegar and actually at making those nematocysts uh, fire. Also, when you start talking about cost, all of us in this room are worried about cost in our agencies. And we start getting into commercial sting aids, they ain't, they're not cheap. And then I hated refilling our med kits when we use vinegar. You're spilling the vinegar on yourself, it, it, it opens up inside the dry bag, and it's just, it's a catastrophe. Uh, so everything's a risk benefit. When we start getting, uh, when we kind of step back, look at USLA ILS guidelines currently, we know, remove the tentacles, we know that works, and we know that warm water works, and that's kind of where we're at. All right, any quick questions on the marine envenomations? I'm going to go over anaphylaxis real fast. And again, and for anyone who walked in late, I am recording this, and I'll have it up later, and I'll show you the link later. Cool. So what we really need to worry about, anaphylaxis. So what's anaphylaxis? Severe allergic reaction. So there's a couple signs and symptoms we look at for anaphylaxis. Uh, you commonly have a rash. So first for anaphylaxis, you have to have an allergen. You have to have something that sets this person off. They may not know they're allergic to it, uh, but more commonly it's going to be animals. Um, most commonly in kids are going to see stuff like peanuts and foods, and then in adults uh, often medications. Uh, but you often have a rash, so you might have eye swelling, periorbital swelling, lip tongue swelling. Uh, you often have a diffuse rash maybe on the chest and arms and across the neck as well. Other things we need, you need a couple of categories to actually define anaphylaxis. And some of those other categories are hypotension, so this is a shock state. All right, that's the danger of anaphylaxis. It's a shock state. You're getting shifting of fluids where the fluid shouldn't be and dropping your blood pressure. That's why it's a life threat because of the hypotension and the airway obstruction. Also, nausea. So if you have a known allergen, a rash, and now someone's coming up with nausea and vomiting, you have to worry about anaphylaxis because what you're actually getting is fluid shifts within your, within your gut and a swelling within the gut, which actually causes nausea and vomiting. So that could be the main symptom that they're experiencing and could show before the hypotension does. So treatment for anaphylaxis, what's the treatment? Airway. Airway, perfect. What else? Epi. Epi, fantastic. So airway and epi, that's it. That's why I say I like to discuss things that a 16-year-old lifeguard can save a life in the first five minutes. This is it. This, they can do more than I can do in the emergency department. That person, if they don't do this, that person dies before the emergency department. Uh, so airway and epinephrine. Who in this room has epinephrine within a protocol for their lifeguards? That's as many as I expected. Um, it is a controversial topic for many reasons. A lot of people are very scared to put an EpiPen in the hands of a 16-year-old um, due to liability issues which don't actually exist. Um, but to think that a 10-year-old who has peanut allergy can do it themselves, a 5-year-old could do it themselves. Um, also cost. The uh, drug, uh, drug agent, uh, companies recently have been so nice to jack up the price of a life-saving drug like epinephrine. It's gone from $100 up to sometimes $600 for a single epinephrine. That's with insurance. Uh, so luckily we do have generics coming out. There are programs to get cheap ones. Um, I just wrote our pro rewrote our protocols for our lifeguards last year and I demanded that epi's in there. I mean, this again, if I, there, there are a few things a 16-year-old can save a life in the first five minutes, and this is one. This is an almost foolproof treatment. These things are designed um, to be easy to use, and so I recommend protocols included. This is the Red Cross uh, video on how to administer epinephrine. So if you're writing protocols and doing training, if you train through the Red Cross, they're, they're already built in um, to the Red Cross training videos and certifications for epinephrine use or certificates for ep epinephrine use. So I, I encourage you to think about it and talk to your medical directors. I think it's, I think it's a shame for a city or an agency to overlook it, kind of being scared that it might be a little too much for a basic lifeguard to do. But again, cost is a huge issue and there are non-EpiPen brands um, that you can use. Did you have a hand up? If you use the EpiPen when it was not warranted, what is the side effect? So that's a fantastic question. Um, and the question was, if you use the EpiPen when it's not warranted, what are the side effects? The side effects are going to be feeling very anxious and have tachycardia and high blood pressure. Say You'll be, the person will feel very anxious. Yeah, okay. Their heart will go fast and their pressure might go up. Okay. They're not going to stroke out. 
Okay. If you give epinephrine to, a, to a, someone who already has a blood pressure of 250, that's not the best thing. You're not going again. You're treating anaphylaxis. If you're just willy nilly giving it, you should probably have a blood pressure before you're giving it, because <laughs> otherwise, why are you treating the patient? That's a fantastic question, because that's what we want to know, especially in the hands of a, uh, a basically trained provider. Is what's the what what could what's the bad thing that happen? Um, and it's a very safe medication. It's something that I would entrust a basically trained first responder and EMT to use because uh, there are obviously medications that have bad side effects. But stuff like this, albuterol, glucose testing, stuff like that, it, there, there aren't bad side effects we have to worry about. But fantastic question. Uh, you, we do, there's a theoretical concern if you have um, a very old person with bad heart disease because because they have blockages in their heart. But again, if you're if this is you trying to save their life from hypotension um, and anaphylaxis, if they came to the emergency department, I don't care their medical history. If they have anaphylaxis, they're getting epinephrine. And that's across the board that would be the standard of care. All right, moving along. So anyone experiencing severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis needs to go to the hospital. That's without question. Even if you give epi and they do better, or even if they have the signs initially, you're kind of on the fence, go to the hospital. These can become disastrous cases. This is where you have a very low threshold, just to have them observed in the hospital. Often we'll observe them at six hours or so, send them home, but you don't want this person airway closing up on the, on the beach. It's generally bad. All right, so we're going to go on to another species, stingrays. So stingrays can be fairly common in some South Florida beaches. We get them up in North Florida as well. Um, they, I'll kind of go over the stinging apparatus. They do need to be differentiated from a manta ray. Uh, this is a manta ray. Um, you can see it's a little bit different. The mouth structure is different. They usually have very wide wings. You guys have probably seen their wing tips on the, up in the water. You're like, shit, that's all, either two sharks or a manta ray. Um, but really cool animals. But they actually don't have a stinging apparatus. It's the stingrays that we worry about. So this is the, the, the barb on the back of a stingray. It actually points backwards from the base of their tail. And what it has under it is this retro serrated bony structure. So that's what's actually under that sheath. Um, and it's kind of waiting uh, to, to attack. And they just, it's a defensive maneuver. If they get stepped on or, or some messing with them, they don't kind of seek you out to sting you or to uh, hit you. They just, it's a defensive maneuver. And the way we most commonly see this is the person steps on top of it, it flips up and, and hits them. And this is the classic stingray injury, is that hole in the ankle. Flips up, they may not even know what happened. They look down, they have a hole in their ankle. And that's why places where you go with lots of stingrays, they often talk about the stingray shuffle. They shuffle your feet through the water so you're not stepping on top of them. You can have some pretty bad injuries. Um, you can have a barb just jammed in your foot and sticking there, pieces. You have some pretty severe bleeding. Um, death does happen. So who died from stingray? Yeah, Steve Irwin. And it's not that it's a toxin killing him, it's that the thing hit him in the heart. Um, so that's the thing. They, they do have a toxin in the sheath, but that's not what kills you. Um, you can have some anaphylactic reactions, but when it hits a structure like the heart or it hits a lung and gives you a pneumothorax, people can die. It's very rare, but people can die. Uh, some other injuries. Um, I have actually seen one in the wrist, a piece in the wrist that came to the hospital as well. So how do we treat these? Well, what do these people look like first? First, intense pain. You just got stabbed in the foot by something. It's like getting stabbed with a knife. It's going to hurt. And there is a toxin within that sheath that will actually cause pain as well. Uh, you'll also get systemic symptoms. So nausea, um, just kind of feeling comfortable. You can get dizziness. You could get some ultramental status. Again, it is a toxin being released in your bloodstream. So often people will just not feel well. Uh, Treatment-wise, there's not much to it. Bleeding control, first off. Um, whether or not you remove the barb, I'll talk about this in a second, is going to kind of be based on local protocols and the, tr and the, and the um, level of the provider as well. Um, I'll show you some pictures and talk about it in a second. But the main treatment is warm water. Warm water is tolerance. So really as hot as they can tolerate, um, that's what you want to lay the, put the appendage in. This is, these are stingray bags, and I think these are out of California. So some of the beaches, they go through times a year where people are just coming up left and right, getting stung. And so they just line them up, put hot water in bags, and they just kind of sit there for 30 minutes with their feet in bags. Um, so that's really the best treatment. That's the only thing that we really know helps uh, with the pain. So in terms of removing the barb, again, it's up to your protocols and your uh, local practice, but if something's kind of sticking in the skin just a tiny bit, you'd hate to send that person to the hospital and incur a bill for that. But obviously, if it's sticking in a joint, 
Um, if it's if it's really in there, if it's if um, if there's any question, go ahead and send them because you because I have actually there are cases of it sticking through with the radial artery, um, sticking through some important structure or actually into a joint that needs to be washed out in the operating room. So you have a very low threshold uh, to send someone. But you've all seen the fishermen who come up with a catfish thing in their in their hand, they just pull it out and you're like, oh, all right, well I guess you're fine. Um, so it's kind of up to your local protocols uh, whether they go to the um, to the hospital or not. Again, up to your protocols, but if you have any signs of allergic reaction, if the barb is still in there, if it's penetrating a joint, it's a very large wound, or neurovascular compromise. So this is a part of your workup and treatment is checking that distal pulse, that distal perfusion, the distal sensation, because you can sever, they can sever nerves um, with, these, with these barbs as well. So making sure you get a thorough neuro exam and any question, they, they need to go to the hospital. Um, they can probably go by car unless they're showing some signs of severe a reaction or a vascular compromise compromise to probably go by ambulance. All right, moving along to spiny fish. So this is pretty common in Florida. Um, fortunately, lionfish are kind of taken over out there. The way these things sting is their dorsal fins. They have 13 dorsal fins that all have spines. Uh, here behind the pelvic fins and then the anal fin all have spines. So if you manipulate or hold these fish in any way, you're going to get stung. So people who actually pull spear these, they have special buckets that they put them in. Um, that's like a one-way valve bucket so you never actually have to handle the fish. Because before you cook it up, which is actually pretty good meat, you have to actually you cut all the spines off. So once the sheath retracts, this is what you see. You see this pretty sharp, nasty, nasty spine. It does have a venom, uh, not like a neurotoxin dangerous venom, but it, it can actually add some, uh, cause some damage and cause some swelling as well. Uh, this is the catfish. So the catfish is not actually these nice little whiskers up front that hurt you. It's the ones behind the fins. Um, so again, if you ever handle catfish, uh, there's actually a, a correct way to do it. And you'll see this a lot in fishermen. They come up with a barb sticking out because it's actually hidden behind the fins, and that's, that's what hits you. Um, but you can see on the right, that guy's, or left, that guy's right hand, that's a, after a, a sting by a lionfish. So it can give a pretty nasty little localized swelling. They can get some downstream effects like uh, necrosis of the skin uh, and whatnot. Many you can get systemic effects just like the stingray. You do have a venom in your bloodstream. So weakness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, vertigo, dizziness. So pe people will actually experience some uh, systemic symptoms. Again, similar to the treatment of stingray, uh, you want to control any bleeding that there is. If there's a spine or something stuck in there that you don't feel comfortable removing, you want to go ahead and stabilize it. Uh, put them in warm water, hot water tolerance, uh, 30 to 60 minutes, and that should help the pain go away. Um, again, but if it, you have a barb stuck in a joint or an odd area you can't get to, or there's nerve vascular compromise, or any question at all, send these patients to the hospital. They're showing signs of an allergic reaction. Um, if they have a lot of pain, large wound, if it's penetrating a joint, you have a low threshold to send them to the hospital. But m most of the people, most of the fishermen getting hit by these things, they're not going to the hospital. They pull it out in the boat, they probably pour a beer on it, and they're good to go for the rest of the day. All right, any questions, marine envenomations? You can see the evidence. We don't really know what to do, but we know warm water works for most of them. All right, lightning strikes. So, very common in Florida. So this is a video off of Daytona Beach in 2015. Kind of show that power of lightning. It's a pretty impressive natural force. Um, and then also this was in California a few years ago where they actually had an MCI from a lightning strike. A couple people died and probably I think 12 or 15 sent to the hospital. Um, so it can, it can, and this one, you can see how sunny that day is. This thing came out of nowhere um, and caught, wreaked a lot of havoc on the beach. <clears throat> So Florida, since we're here, we'll talk about it, but we can always lead the nation in lightning strikes for the most part. You can see we, we blow it out, 46. Um, this was fatality 2004, 2013. So you can see it's actually a pretty rare event to die from lightning strike. That's nine years of data and 46 people in the state died. It, it's, it's not a totally rare occurrence, but you much more likely for some other things to happen. Um, we see in California over here uh, kind of in the, in the mid-range as well. So there's a couple different ways that lightning strike. I love using these videos. They're put up by Noah, but I just think they're the most hilarious animations. Um, but this is, this is a direct strike, so the lightning actually hits you. This is actually the least common injury from lightning. It's one we're all scared of, but actually it's least commonly that that's just your crappy luck that you get hit by a bolt of lightning. Side uh, flash or side splash, that's actually where you're next to a tree or a lifeguard tower or a light pole or something. It hits that tall object and splashes over to you. The most common is ground current, so it hits a tall object, travels to the ground, and then comes up through you. And then conduction, so that's where it hits this tree, it actually travels on this long fence that the guy's standing next to, and then hits him. So most commonly it's actually going to be ground current. 
this is ferning. I just always like to show this is kind of cool. So when people get hit by lightning, this is actually a kind of classic sign is this ferning. The electricity kind of travels down salt channels in your skin and you get this kind of almost beautiful effect and it can actually be permanent. And some lightning survivors actually get it tattooed on their skin to kind of remember the, the incident. Um, but if you come on an MCI, this is a, a case I love to do when I'm doing surfing medicine stuff. If you come on an MCI, 10 people down on the beach, you don't know what happened. And then you see this, oh crap, this, someone got hit by lightning. <clears throat> so we'll go into the treatment of, of lightning strikes. Um, most common, sudden cardiac death is the most common cause of death in lightning strike. So that's what kills people is sudden cardiac death. If they don't initially die from sudden cardiac death, most people survive. You actually, most people who hit and don't immediately die of, of uh, heart issues will actually survive the event. You can get neurologic effects. Uh, there's a guy, I think, in St. Augustine a couple years ago and got, he got hit, and he survived it, but he had devastating neurologic injury. could be from a couple things. No one actually truly knows. There can be direct effects. People can get spinal cord injury from it, brain injury. A lot of time, it's just the hypoxia. Because if the sudden cardiac death doesn't kill you, what kills people next is, um, is uh, respiratory arrest. So the heart's actually still beating, but now their system's stunned and they stop breathing. And so then they die from a, a, a respiratory arrest or get neurologic injury from that. And that will play into how we treat these patients. So you can really get any fatal arrhythmia from heart, uh, from lightning strike. You can go immediately go to asystole. You can go to a shock wheel V-fib attack. You can go into a, a sinus arrhythmia. There, no one really knows how you die, but you can suddenly die or you can have a respiratory arrest that kills you later. So treatment wise, what do we do with these folks? First off, protect yourself. So in a lightning area, you never want to be the tallest object. You never want to be next to the tallest object. And on the beach, we are the tallest objects. Um, I think we are pretty bad as a profession, at least in my agency, is of getting our guards off the beach. Um, we we kind of wait to that last minute. And, there, and lightning and strike from far away, we're pretty bad. We kind of make our guards sit up there and, and wait to get everyone out of the water. But they're, they're sitting 10, 15, 20 feet above anything else. Um, so really, protect yourself. When you see something like this um, coming in, that's your classic 430 storm in Florida, um, you want to go ahead and start seeking shelter. Uh, the best place to be is inside a building. Second place, best place to be is inside a car with a hard top. Um, otherwise, don't, don't seek uh, cover under a tree. Don't seek cover under a lifeguard stand. You really need to try to get out of the environment. So again, protect yourselves. Um, this is that, that MCI case in California. Lifeguards are running into the scene. Uh, just remember that these people just got killed by lightning. Um, so just have that sense of, yeah, we need to go treat these patients, but in your mind, we probably need to get these patients, we probably need to load them and get the hell out of there. Um, because it's just like a, it's like a mass shooting. It's like a fire. Uh, protect yourself, scene safety. Um, don't just stay and play in a bad environment. If you get yourself caught in a wilderness environment, and I've done this myself, unfortunately, and you just get yourself in a bad situation and you're in the, you have no other choice there's trees all around you um, this is what's called the lightning position there's no evidence that this works because you can't study this <laughs> but most lightning most light unless we're looking for volunteers uh, but most lightning experts say this is probably the best thing you can do what this does this person's on a rubber mat they ideally have shoes on um, they are crouched down to make themselves as compact as possible to make themselves a small target. They're actually covering their ears because you get blast injuries to the, to the ear drums as well. And then what this guy's doing over here and what she's doing you can't see is they're connecting their heels. And the idea is that a ground current comes up toward the feet, crosses over the next heel back down to the feet and goes away. No evidence it works. But this is current recommendations. If you're stuck in a wilderness environment, you got no real, nothing else to do, uh, this is probably your best chance. So how do we treat these patients? We all know about triage and how we triage people. A normal triage practice is you kind of, the dead people are dead. If you open their airway and they're dead, they're dead. And you go on and treat the other folks. What we do in, in lightning is actually what's called reverse triage. We take that dead expired category and we actually put them up front and we treat them first. Because like I said, commonly, um, if their heart is still beating, they're actually dying from respiratory arrest, or they may have just died due to respiratory arrest, and so it's actually a hypoxic event. It's not a heart attack, it's a hypoxic event. Um, it's almost like drowning like I talked about yesterday. So if you can get in there, give them breaths, then you may actually save them. So what we do is you come on scene, 10 lightning strike people, you go around and start assessing. If someone's not breathing, you actually start breathing for them and start performing CPR and treat them first. Because like I said, if they survive that initial cardiac arrest, generally they do fine and survive the event. So it's not like a, a mass shooting, bleeding injury. 
And then when you talk about BLS, ACLS, everything's the same. There's no changes. The person's not charged. You can touch them immediately. Uh, but everything's the same as anything else. Anyone who gets struck by lightning, no matter how they look, send them to the hospital. All right? Just send them. They'll get, their, they'll get their heart rhythm monitored, make sure everything is looking okay. Next, we'll talk about hyperthermia. So very commonly, obviously in Florida, that we see this. Down here in South Florida, we see it all year round. Uh, hyperthermia and heat injuries is a continuum, starting all the way from heat edema all the way to heat stroke. There's a thousand different definitions you can kind of put in there. But there's two main ones we, we worry about, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. It's important for your guards to be able to differentiate the two. In general, 104 degrees or 40 C delineates heat exhaustion, heat stroke. That's been brought into question. There's not really a temperature cutoff because you can be heat stroke and have a temperature of 102. You can be heat exhaustion and have a temperature of 108. So it's really not the temperature that matters, it's the neurologic effects. So someone has no neurologic effects and they are, that's generally heat exhaustion. They come up to you like, oh man, I'm just, I'm exhausted. They're still sweating okay. They just are really tired. That's more of a heat exhaustion. When you come up to them and they are completely altered, and they can't perform their duties, and they can't talk to you, and they're not sweating anymore, that's when you worry about heat stroke. Um, that's, that's a life threat. Two main types of heat stroke. There are the classic and exertional. So the old lady is classic. That's pa patients often debilitated, very young, very old. They can't get to fluids. They can't turn on their air conditioner. Um, they can't get out of bed. Uh, they, that's your classic heat stroke. This happens over day, hours to days. So it takes a couple hours. If any of you guys ride rescue, you've come to that house that it's July, the AC broke, and grandma can't get out of bed uh, or call someone to fix it, and her temp's 106. So that's classic heat stroke. Exertional happens quickly. That's your marathon runners, your long distance runners. They've just run for the last hour and a half, and now their temp's 107. So that happens over a short time. The classic happens over a long time. Generally, the same disease. Treatment-wise, ABCs. You start with ABCs, obviously. And then once you cover that, you cool these patients. And how you cool them, there's, there's some evidence of what works best, but it's going to be your, your local protocols. Uh, first off, you want to go ahead and get them out of the environment and just kind of start actively cooling them. So if you can get them out of the sun, if they're just kind of heat exhaustion or they're able, able to still mentate and drink fluids, give them some nice fluids. Just get them out of that environment. Um, generally, uh, I like to bring these patients back to our life rest station into the first aid room that has air conditioning. Or if we have to, if they're pretty mild, just put an umbrella over them. Just, or put them in the cab of the truck and crank up the AC. Just stop the process and get them out of the environment. Then how you cool them is going to be based on, again, your protocols. The, one of the absolute best ways to cool someone is ice bath. That's really the best way. The big races and marathons and then football games, stuff you see, they use ice bath. Ice bath is obviously hard because you have to have an ice bath. Um, and it's hard to monitor patients and monitor vital signs. And if they're altered or very sick, you're not going to just dunk someone in the water. But do know evidence-wise, this is actually one of the best ways you can possibly do it. Another great way is uh, cool mist with a fan. Um, that's just kind of tepid water and a fan going in the person, a spray bottle spraying them with mist. What's that do what that's doing essentially is stimu uh, simulating sweat for them. So if you, some places have that set up, some hospitals that have lots of hyperthermic patients, they have just a bunch of misting fans and that helps a lot as well. But mainly stopping the process and then anything you have, if, if it's cool rags, if it's ice packs in the axilla and groin, whatever you have, as long as you're stopping the process. Uh, the people that need to go to the hospital are the ones who are not improving and the ones showing neurological changes. So if they're altered and hot, send them on their way. Okay, if they're kind of that borderline, like they're just exhausted and stuff, you can treat them. And if they start improving and the temp's coming down or they're able to tolerate fluids, like, oh man, I'm really feeling much better, they don't need to go to the hospital. It's really ones that have neurologic changes. And lastly, remember your glucose monitoring. You hate to misdiagnose a hypoglycemia as a, a, a heat stroke uh, and then totally miss the boat. So uh, really, when you have that heat stroke patient, make sure you're covering all the bases. Hey, did anyone see him fall? Did anyone see him drinking alcohol all day? Let's check a blood sugar real quick um, just to make sure you're not missing anything. All right, last category, then we're done. Hemorrhage control. So this is a pretty serious injury when it comes to surfers. When we're talking about actual leading causes of, of uh, death, Drowning is obviously up there, but fin cuts and hemorrhage. That's, it's, and now in the community, there's a huge push for this, especially in South Florida. I mean, every agency is getting federal funding now uh, to put out bleed kits, which is great. Um, most of this is by Stop the Bleed, which is by American College of Surgeons. You guys have probably heard of it. It seems like every hospital and every clinic now is doing Stop the Bleed training. Um, so the whole idea of this, again, how can a otherwise untrained or basic trained responder save a life and, and temporize the situation until rescue is able to get there? 
So we have our, our bleeding patient here. Um, steps to stop bleeding, is, these are the steps, okay? Really, the first five things you should do is direct pressure. If you have direct pressure and it's not stopping, add more direct pressure. If that's not helping, add more direct pressure. Direct pressure is going to stop a majority of your bleeding. And that's what we really need to hammer into our lifeguards. Um, I, tourniquets are fantastic. They're awesome. Um, they're a very safe device to use. They save lives. But I think what we're seeing it more in EMS now, and lifeguards that are actually carrying these things now, and a lot of them are kind of forgetting the direct pressure. They say, okay, I pressed on, now doesn't stop. All right, I'm cranking a tourniquet on this person. No, really, direct pressure stops the majority of bleeding. Um, but go ahead and, um, and make sure your lifeguards understand that. Who here carries tourniquets for the lifeguard agency? Cool. Uh, that's awesome. Um, we're, I'm still kind of getting it through our, our um, city to do it. Uh, it's, there's no reason not to. Absolutely no reason when you look at the evidence not to. For years it was thought to be dangerous because, oh my God, this person might lose their leg or their arm. There are plenty of surgeries that are done. Peter can attest this in the OR. Hours, four, six hours of tourniquet use and the limb is still fine afterward. And again, I'd rather walk out without an arm out of the hospital than be, than be dead. So there's no reason why uh, we shouldn't have tourniquets on our beaches. Uh, again, direct pressure is going to be the first thing. If it's a large wound, so maybe a gunshot wound, um, and it's gaping, really the best thing to do is start stuffing that wound. Um, obviously, uh, our barriers are protective barriers, but if you have a bunch of gauze, you're going to make that wound dirty as hell, but you might save a life. You start actually putting the gauze in whatever uh, stuff you have. Some people have combat gauze and whatnot into that wound and then holding pressure, so you're really tamponading all that bleeding. And really, you need to hold pressure correctly. I didn't learn this until I was an intern in the ICU, and I, I caused a bad bleeding when I was putting a, a big line in someone. And I was kind of holding it, and it wouldn't stop. And then the fellow came in, got on top of the bed like he was doing CPR, and put all of his weight on top of the femoral artery. And that's how he stopped it. Um, so really, if in an intense situation, you put your entire weight on top of that, on top of that bleed, because that might be what it takes to stop it. Uh, tourniquet use, I won't go through them because every tourniquet is different. I'll talk about each one, uh, but hopefully you guys have any protocols. If you don't, I would really talk to your medical directors about it. Uh, they're always welcome to contact me as well. Um, but why we use a tourniquet? It's really life-threatening bleeding. So what the heck is life-threatening bleeding? Uh, well, that is blood that is spurting out of the wound. That's more commonly going to be an arterial bleed. It's often very hard to differentiate arterial and venous, and venous bleeding can be de deadly as well. But if you take your hand off and whoosh, across the room, it spurts. It's probably an artery. Uh, blood that won't stop coming out of the wound, so no matter what you do, it's not stopping. Uh, loss of part of an arm or leg, so you have a complete amputation. It's probably go good to go ahead and use it. And then bleeding in a patient who's now unconscious or confused. That's a sign of a shock state. Okay, They're now, they're now not perfusing well. Um, so those, those are all good reasons to go ahead and use a tourniquet. So here's some different ones that we see. Um, this is cat T, soft T, and then the SWAT T. They all have weird names. Um, but very commonly, cat T is kind of what we most commonly see in, in EMS. Um, there's a thousand different ones in the market. That's been the sexy thing to do in the last 10 years is develop new tourniquets. And this is another, talking about sexy things, this is a surfboard leash. Um, this is called the, the Omna Surf Leash Tourniquet. And this is actually a leash that you can then deploy and pull out and becomes a tourniquet. Um, very little evidence for any of these devices. <laughs> CAT-T, SWAT-T, those are known to work in, in, within the military realm. Uh, but you'll see new devices come out all the time. You really look into what you're buying because people are really trying to invent cool stuff, but none of it, a lot of it doesn't have any evidence. So really, that CAT-T, SWAT-T, they have decades of evidence behind it. We know they work. Um, really, self-designed self tourniquets, they really have no place in pre-hospital care. Um, you really need all the components you need the actual wrap itself and then what's called the windlass. That's what makes a tourniquet a tourniquet. That's the difference between putting a belt around yourself or you need what you, a crank, a windlass, and what that does is really crank it down. We see people come to the trauma center all the time, electrical cords wrapped around, belts, uh, shirts, towels, and they're not doing anything. They're not stopping the bleeding at all. Uh, so that's actually it. I'm just going to put this up here. Um, again, I teach for Surfing Medicine International, um, and this is an app we developed a few years ago, and it's now free, so I don't get any money from this. But I think it's a cool app to either lifeguard or if you're doing an education for surfers in the community. This just goes through common surfing injuries and tells you how to treat it and gives you a bunch of other stuff. It, it tells you the number for 911 and whatever location you're in. Um, so if you want to check it out, it's free. Uh, but it's got a lot of this information on there. Um, 
So that with that, I'm going to wrap up. Again, this is the web address to the handout, which has everything you need to know. And I'll also put a link to the video on it in the next couple days or so. And then I'll open the floor for any questions on this. Um, I'll be around for a couple minutes, any questions of anything medically related. Other than that, we're done. So.